Your true wealth is your time and freedom. Money is just a tool for trading your time. It's a container to store your economic energy until you're ready to deploy it. But the whole world has been turned away from real money and has been fooled into using currency. A deceitful imposter that is silently stealing your two most valuable assets, your time and your freedom. Welcome to the rabbit hole. We are entering a period of financial crisis that is the greatest the world has ever known. The wealth transfer that will take place during this decade is the greatest wealth transfer in history. Wealth is never destroyed, it is merely transferred, and that means that on the opposite side of every crisis there is an opportunity. The great news is that all you have to do to turn this crisis into your great opportunity is to educate yourself. I believe that the best investment that you can make in your lifetime is your own education. Education on the history of money, education on finance, education on how the global economy works, education on how all of these guys, the central bankers, the stock market, how they can cheat you, how they can scam you. If you learn what is going on and how the financial world works, you can put yourself on the correct side of this wealth transfer. Winston Churchill once said that the further you look into the past, the further that you can see into the future. This program is all about creating your own crystal ball, being able to gaze into the future, being able to change this crisis, the greatest crisis in the history of mankind, into your great opportunity. The hidden secrets of money, some of them are hidden in plain sight. They're like right in front of you. Uh, the way the monetary system works is something that isn't actually hidden away from all of us. It's out in the open, but it's complex and people just don't, they can't see how it works. It's hard for them to imagine that we're living in such a hoax. Others are meant to be secret, but the truth is slowly coming out, like the Federal Reserve being a private corporation and not really part of the US government. But when I started studying this, uh, what I found was that there was no place that I could point people to where they could get it all in one spot. And so I basically decided to write my book about it and consolidate monetary history, economics, the markets, uh, fundamentals of gold and silver. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors in economics and I've sort of made it my job to lift the fog for people. Welcome to Egypt. This is where it all began. Roughly 5,000 years ago, the Egyptians started using gold and silver as their predominant form of currency. But it was not yet money. The pieces of gold and silver that they were using were odd sizes and weights, odd purities, so it still was not interchangeable, where each unit is the same as the next. This meant that nothing really had a price yet. You couldn't put a price of so many coins on something because they didn't have coins yet. Trade was still difficult. It was still a guessing game when it came to the exchange of values. One of the reasons that we are in the financial mess that we are today globally is that people do not understand the difference between currency and money. Currency is a medium of exchange, a unit of account. It is portable, durable, divisible, and something called fungible. Fungible means that each unit is the same as the next unit. A dollar in my pocket buys the same amount as a dollar in your pocket. Money is all of those things plus a store of value over a long period of time. Even financial planners, bankers, your accountant, they don't understand the difference between currency and money. The currency in your pocket is a medium of exchange. It's a unit of account because it's got numbers on it. It's somewhat durable, it's portable, it's divisible in that you can make change, and it's fungible. A dollar in my pocket buys the same amount as a dollar in your pocket. But because governments can print more and more and more of it and dilute the currency supply, it's continually transferring wealth out of your pocket, out of your bank account, to the government. 
and to the banking system. The reason that gold and silver are the optimum form of money is because of their properties. It's an easy medium of exchange because gold and silver store a large amount of value in a very small area. It's a unit of account. Pure gold has the same value all over the planet. So an ounce of gold buys the same amount here in Egypt as it would in China or in the United States. It's durable. The same gold that Egyptians were using in trade 5,000 years ago is still here with us today. It does not corrode. It's divisible. You can make change with it. It's very portable. You could use something like oil as money. It's just that you can't carry around a barrel of oil on your back. It's fungible. Pure gold is the same wherever it is on Earth. Pure silver is the same wherever it is on Earth. It's limited in quantity. That's the reason that it maintains its purchasing power. Governments cannot print it. Over the last 5,000 years, only gold and silver have maintained their purchasing power. There have been thousands upon thousands of fiat currencies, currencies that are unbacked by gold or silver, and they have all gone to zero. It's a 100% failure rate. Well, fiat currency, of course, is um, a currency that is, exists at the dictate or by fiat from a, from a government. You see, they have their printing presses, and the paper money rolls off the printing presses. And then they give it the fiat designation, which in, makes the, the currency official. It's just worthless paper. But when Ben Bernanke gives it the special sign, and they have the cult meeting at the Federal Open Market Committee meetings, it suddenly becomes currency. If you look at what's really going on, it's, it's a con game. And so there's confidence. Well, the Federal Reserve is very forthright about what they're doing. If you read their websites, they'll tell you it's a confidence game. They tell you that there's no intrinsic value in their money. They'll tell you that they print it back by absolutely nothing. They actually display all these facts. But if you tell somebody in the public that this stuff is created out of thin air, there's no backing whatsoever, it's absolutely worthless, it's about as valuable as monopoly money, they'll look at you like you're nuts. Is there an example throughout history of a fiat currency, a piece of paper that's unbacked by anything, surviving? Short answer, no. Long answer, no. And here's why. When Addison Wiggin took over at the Daily Record, when I got cranked up, uh, Bill Warner asked him to catalog all of the fiat currencies throughout history and what happened to each of them. Addison dutifully went to work. Within a short period of time, he had gone through the alphabet. All the fiat currencies that started with the letter A were done. They all went to zero. He was halfway through the letter B and all the fiat currencies that started with the letter B, and there were six hundred of them in just the first letter and a half of the alphabet and every single one of them went to zero. Every one. 600 fiat currencies that start with the letter A and half of the ones that start with the letter B are 600 of these things. Not one ever came close. You think this one, the United States dollar, is going to be the first one after all that? I don't think so. No. No currency, fiat currency has ever survived. None. The thing about money is there actually is a fairly well accepted definition of what money is. The question is, as you apply that definition to particular things that, are, that people claim to be money, do they fit the definition? Well, just take the paper dollar, for example. How well does it perform those functions? Well, store of value. Uh, the dollar has lost 95% of its purchasing power uh, since the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913. So not very good as a store of value. One of the things I do is uh, just a way to get the audience's attention is I have a slide and there are three pictures on the slide. One is a pile of monopoly money. The other one is a pile of Federal Reserve notes, uh, what Americans would call paper money. Uh, and the other one is a solid gold uh, American Eagle uh, one ounce coin. And the title of the slide is which of these is not like the other and if you know the show Sesame Street or you have children who watch it, it's one of the favorite vignettes in Sesame Street and what it really is is a kind of IQ test for five-year-olds. They're supposed to look at the three things and look at characteristics and find the one that's not like the other. Well, I've shown this slide to um, groups of you know, Ivy League University professors, and I've also shown it to, uh, you know, uh, children, you know, kind of five years old, my nieces and nephews and so forth. Uh, and when the uh, professors look at it, they say, well, 
Um, clearly, the, uh, the dollars are not like the others because gold has no role as money, and monopoly money is junk, and the American dollar is a store of value, so that's not like the other. But the children look at it and they say, well, the gold coin is not like the other because the other two are just piles of paper and the gold coin is clearly something different. So my question to the audience is, who's smarter, a five-year-old or an Ivy League professor? Before World War I, each note that a treasury issued would say that there have been deposited with the United States Treasury $20 in gold coin payable to the bearer upon demand. The money was in the vault the currency was a note they gave you that was a claim check, only a claim check on the money, the same as if you go to the dry cleaners and you give them your shirt and they give you a claim check for your shirt. The value is, is that shirt at the dry cleaners, not the piece of paper that says that you own that shirt. So our currency that circulated was the paper US dollars and they were claim checks on money. The proper definition of inflation, I use Milton Friedman's definition. Inflation is an expansion of the currency supply. Deflation is a contraction of the currency supply. If you expand the currency supply, eventually prices will rise. And if you contract the currency supply, eventually prices will fall. This is a pool, but it's not a pool of water. This is a, the currency pool. And these are prices. And if you expand the currency supply, prices like a sponge in water have to rise to suck up the excess currency. Governments never stop printing more currency and adding currency to circulation. Therefore, prices keep on going up not because the stuff that you're trying to buy is changing. The real estate doesn't change. What has changed is the currency purchases less and less. It's the currency going down, not prices going up. The truth is, what we have that makes our world work right now is a big story. None of it's real. It's all just promises. And if you think about it, that's how currency began to work in the beginning. You know, before we had currency, we had barter. I'll give you three coconuts and you give me four fish, because that's kind of a fair exchange on coconuts to fish. But that got complicated, so we had to invent this thing called money to be a divisible, portable medium of exchange. And the challenge is, is that we lost that a long time ago. We lost having things of value be our currency. And now we have this thing called numbers and accounts. But trust me, it is not real. It's a big, made-up story. One of the biggest make-believe stories ever is called quantitative easing, which sounds complex, but it's really just a smoke and mirrors term for currency creation. QE started with the banking bailouts back in 2009. This currency was created out of thin air and then given to the banks who paid themselves record bonuses in reward for crashing the world economy. This is a global phenomenon, but all you have to remember for now is that whether it's QE bailouts or stimulus programs, these are all just voodoo, hocus pocus terms for increased currency creation. Egypt is an amazing place. There's a franticness about it, an utter chaos, especially like the traffic. But when it comes to like all of the merchants that are trying to get every last dime out of you, you get fleeced to the point where you come back with an empty wallet. <laughs> but you know what? They're amateurs compared to Wall Street. In the past several years, I've, I've spoken in many countries about the crisis that's coming, and a lot of people think that they're going to be okay in their country, that it's only going to happen to the United States or maybe the United States in Europe. Uh, but what they don't realize is that this is a global phenomenon. I've got to show you something here. This is a base currency in the United States. This is the number of paper dollars that exist, basically. It took 200 years to go from no dollars in existence to 825 billion. And then we had the bailouts, and then we had QE1, quantitative easing, one, then QE2, and then we had QE3, and then QE4, and then soon we're going to have QE57 and QE382. <laughs> and uh, it isn't just here. This is what the Canadian currency supply looks like. This is Australia, South Africa, Russia. Now, this starts out in just the year 2001, 
And this is like 18 times more currency in existence in a little over a decade. Uh, here's Singapore, same story. Look at that, since the crisis, just bam. India, China, every government on the planet is doing this insane deficit spending and expanding their currency supplies, uh, doing bailouts, and history shows that th there is no example of this turning out well. It is sometimes amazing that we haven't experienced more inflation than we have. If they keep expanding the money supply so vastly, why aren't our prices growing faster than they really are? And the answer is that a good chunk of the money that the Fed created has been shipped overseas. Uh, I remember early in my research, I heard this expression that the Americans have exported their inflation. I thought, what is that? How can you export your inflation? Put it in a box and send it out? What do you do? Well, now I understand you export your inflation by simply sending all these dollars that you created to these other countries, and then they send you their refrigerators and their cars and whatever, their TV sets. So you get hardware, and they get little pieces of paper. It's a great deal for the American people for a while. For a while. Sooner or later, all of those pigeons come home to roost. When the time comes, as it looks like it's now coming, when the rest of the world is saying, uh-uh, we don't want to play this game anymore. Uncle Sam's dollars are just becoming worthless. There are too many of them. We've got to find something else other than American dollars. Then those dollars start to come back to America. People say, we don't want them anymore. What do we do with them? Once this uh, revs up and we've got this, uh, this little trickle of money coming back that we previously exported, when, once it becomes a flood, and it starts to rush back, now we are getting our former exported inflation brought back to us, and then we'll see the quantity of money inside the United States grow much more rapidly, even than the Federal Reserve can create it, because we're getting a previous money back. And uh, that's when we will really see the tanking of the U.S. dollar in terms of what it will buy. During the second round of quantitative easing, global food prices went up 60%. And this created a humanitarian disaster for the two billion people on Earth who live on less than two dollars a day. These people were hungry to start with, they became hungrier, and some of them started overthrowing their governments in North Africa and around the Middle East. So quantitative easing was the spark that ignited the Arab Spring. So that's, that's it. When you create money, you get some sort of inflation. It just depends on where the inflation goes. It's all going down, 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 peasants are reeling from a game of coins and crowns. Given the premise that you have a permanent underclass or poor class and how does inflation affect them disproportionately, um, it affects them basically in the percentage of their income that goes to food. And we see this as a ratio and we know that there are some danger points, for example, in Egypt recently, once that ratio got to 40% of income going to food and the price of food rising due to inflation, when it got to 40%, that's uh, historically a point where people actually stage a revolution. That's exactly what we saw. The French Revolution, similarly, was all around the price of food getting to a certain critical point where people simply, the risk reward for revolution was favorable toward revolution. When they print it up, then it all goes down. Well, exactly right, because when you have a runaway inflation, it's punishing the very people who are most productive in society. In other words, the people that produce more than they consume and save the difference. The problem is, is that those productive people, the savers, save in their national currency. And unfortunately, the national currency is just a fiat piece of paper at this point. So when it's destroyed through runaway inflation, that uh, $100,000 that you were hoping to retire on doesn't exist. And the things that you were going to buy with it and provide for others don't exist either. Now what are you going to do? The world is going to have a new monetary system in this decade that we're in. We're going to experience this huge deflationary crash around the world and people will just lose confidence in currency. And what do they always go back to throughout history? time after time for the last 5,000 years actually, they always go back to gold and silver.
Athens was the first society to have a working tax system and free markets. This enabled them to rise to the pinnacle of civilization. Their prosperity allowed them to create great works of art and achieve a level of architecture and engineering that the world had not yet seen. Here we are 2,500 years later and people are still in awe of their achievements. It was truly a fantastic period in human history and the Athens star shone brightly for many years. So this begs the question, what went wrong? How did such a great and powerful civilization fall? The answer lies in the same pattern that we see throughout history. Too much greed and too much war. It was when the Athenians got involved in the Peloponnesian Wars, a war with Sparta, that their monetary problems began. First, they lost access to their gold and silver mines. They were also paying armies that were on foot and they were miles and miles away from Athens. So as they pay their armies to buy goods and services from the local populations, a deflation occurs in Athens because they're sending all of their coinage out of the city. Then they started debasing their coinage to pay for the war. If you take in a thousand coins in taxes and then you melt those down, those gold coins, and you mix 50% copper into your gold, now you can mint 2,000 coins. So if you take in only 1,000 coins, but you spend 2,000 coins, what is that called? That is deficit spending. Athens began to do that during this war with Sparta. They also had these great public works, which were very expensive, and they finished the Temple of Athena Nike during the truce in the middle. There was a six-year truce in the middle of this 27-year war. So they didn't stop their great public works and allow their market economy to heal from the expense of this war. As they debased their coinage, people would take the new debased coins at face value at first, until there were a whole bunch of those, and there's something called Gresham's Law where people tend to uh, save to keep the thing that's rare, and they spend the thing that's common into circulation first. So all of the gold and silver coins started to disappear from circulation and become quite rare, and it was just these copper coins. Suddenly, it took a whole bunch of copper coins to buy a gold or silver coin, one of those old gold or silver coins. This is the first time that gold or silver ever had a price. Before that, everything was measured in a weight of gold and silver. So a large factor in Athens' downfall was the expense of war, the expansion of empire, the debasement of their currency, the eventual inflation that was caused. You know, they minted these coins until they became nothing but flecks of copper. This was actually the world's first hyperinflation. And what it did was it financially debilitated Athens to the point where in 404 BC they surrendered to Sparta. And eventually they became nothing but a satellite of Rome. The thing that amazes me is how history just keeps on repeating and repeating and repeating and we never learn from all of our stupid mistakes. We just repeat the same stupid mistakes over and over and over again. Today we are doing the same thing that the Athenians did that caused the loss of their great culture. We're doing the same currency debasement. We're doing the same deficit spending and it's for the same reasons. It's for war and it's for great public works. The interesting thing about the, the Peloponnesian War was how it started. Um, I would say one of the interesting parallels is that it's, it started really with Athens at its height and with a, a level of hubris that set them down the road towards ruin. Perhaps they felt that they were, uh, you know... Superior, superior, couldn't make a mistake, exactly. they knew better. Exactly. <laughs> and they ended up destroying their society as a result. It's a road that we're going down today, right? I think absolutely. Yeah. There was a play written uh, shortly after the Peloponnesian Wars about the worthlessness of the copper flecks that uh, are, were their coinage at the time. So we, we go from gold and silver, very high value money, to a currency that has a face value. And it's the first example that I can find in history uh, where a war was, uh, war and great public works were being funded through deficit spending.
What you've just seen is the first recorded example of one of the most predictable hidden secrets of money, the seven stages of empire. It's a long-term cycle that echoes throughout history right to this very day and is basically a societal pendulum that swings from quality money to quantity currency and back again to quality money. It always plays out in seven stages. It always ends with gold delivering a knockout blow to debased currencies. And it goes like this. Stage one, a country starts out with good money, which is either gold or silver, or it's backed by gold or silver. Stage two, as it develops economically and socially, it begins to take on more and more economic burdens, adding layer upon layer of public works. Stage three, as its economic affluence grows, so does its political influence, and it increases expenditures to fund a massive military. Stage four, Eventually, it puts its military to use, and expenditures explode. Stage 5. To fund the war, it steals the wealth of its people by debasing their coinage with base metals, or by replacing their money with currency that can be created in unlimited quantities. Stage 6. The loss in purchasing power of the expanded currency supply is sensed by the population and the financial markets, triggering a loss of faith in the currency. Stage 7. A mass movement out of currency into precious metals and other tangible assets takes place. The currency collapses and gold and silver rise in price as they account for the huge quantity of currency that was created. This process transfers massive wealth to those who had the foresight to position themselves beforehand in real money, gold and silver. You know, our monetary system uh, basically steals from the poor and middle class and transfers the wealth to the banks. We see this throughout history, and it's just repeating over and over again. What's happening in Greece right now is basically the same thing that was happening back in 407 BC. The deficit spending to fund all of these public works and the debasement of their currency supply caused them to become nothing but a satellite of Rome. Today, they're becoming nothing but a satellite of the banks. The next question is, how does this affect you? My next stop was in London where I'd been asked to give a presentation to a group of businessmen. They wanted to understand the reason that gold had surged recently, and I explained to them that to understand gold, you have to understand monetary history. Once you see where we've come from, you can get a much clearer understanding of how the seven stages of empire are playing out right now. We weren't allowed to show their faces, but we were allowed to film my presentation. So here it is, the last 140 years of monetary history condensed into just 10 minutes. Keep the seven stages of empire in mind, and as you watch this, see if you can recognize the signs. Everybody thinks the U.S. dollar is still as good as gold, and it hasn't been since 1971. This is the uh, world monetary systems. Uh, from 1873, when Germany went on the classical gold standard, where each unit of currency is backed up by an equivalent amount of gold in the treasury. In the United States, $20 bill, $20 gold piece in the vaults. Go into any bank, slap down your currency, which was a receipt for money, a claim check on money, ask for your money, gold and silver, and they would give it to you. So this shows, this is currency, this is money. Otherwise, there was no reason for any government to store gold in their vaults and then print this currency that was backed by gold. This is what gives confidence in that, and it gives governments the ability to start this scam in the first place, where they print these receipts for gold, and then they can print more of them than, than gold that exists. And that happened when we got to World War I, and all the combatants stopped redemption rights. You could no longer go in the bank and, and trade your pounds, lira, marks, francs, no longer redeemable in gold and they lit up the printing presses and started printing like crazy. Then between the wars, they went on something called the gold exchange standard, where currencies would be backed partially by gold. So in the United States, under the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, we could, the Federal Reserve was allowed to put uh, $50 worth of claim checks on gold, currency in circulation, backed up by only $20 worth of gold. So it was a 40% reserve ratio. For every $20 gold piece in the vault, they could uh, put $50 in circulation. We're the dollars of the nation on parade. We're the 
the biggest batch of dollars ever made. Oh, we used to march by millions, but now we march by billions, and maybe we'll be trillions for your day. The uh, then we get to 1944. Now, during both wars, Europe paid the U.S. with gold. Uh, during World War I, the U.S. didn't get into the war until the very end of it. We didn't really have troops on the ground here in any quantity until the last six months of the war. So for the first four years or so, we're selling you all of, you know, you take all of your young men off of the farms and turn them into soldiers. You take your factories that make toasters and they start making machine guns. Your factories that made cars are now building tanks. And uh, so you turn your economy toward war and all of your consumer goods and your grains had to be imported from the United States and, and you paid us with gold. Uh, then in World War II, Hitler starts saber rattling in 1936, uh, annexes Austria in 38, invades Poland in 39, uh, Pearl Harbor wasn't until the end of 1941. We didn't have troops on the ground until, I believe, August of 42. So again, there's like six years where you're paying us with your gold and we're selling you stuff. This is where Americans have this myth that war is good for the economy. War is good for the economy if you're not in it and you're selling them the tools of the trade. Yes, America's national income gets bigger and bigger. In 1943, it was $142 billion. That was double the 1939 figure, triple the figure for 1933. But by the end of World War II, the U.S. had two-thirds of all the world's monetary gold, the central bank gold, and the rest of the world had to share the other third, and Europe had none. So the world monetary system was no longer going to work. It would collapse. But we had made all these loans of dollars to Europe, so Europe was flooded with dollars. And so representatives from around the world met at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire in 1944. They came up with a new world monetary system called the Bretton Woods system, where every currency on the planet, with the exception of just a few, they would be backed by the U.S. dollar, and the U.S. dollar would then be backed by gold at $35 per ounce. This gave confidence to all currencies. Uh, so this gave the world stability and it pegged all the world's currencies to each other through the dollar to yeah. gold. So there was no such thing as the forex. Currencies didn't float. Uh, the exchange rates were fixed year after year, and this helped to make world trade boom. Then the dollar standard starts because we kept on printing dollars. Under the Bretton Woods system, there, there was no reserve ratio established where the U.S. actually had to have a certain amount of gold for how many dollars we created. So. We had done a bunch of deficit spending for Korea, for Vietnam, for Johnson's Great Society, and expanded the currency supply, the amount of uh, paper dollars in circulation, and exported them all over the world. And then in the 60s, Charles de Gaulle, president of France, realizes that we don't have the gold to back up the dollars. Le fait que beaucoup d'États acceptent par principe des dollars au même titre que de l'or, entraîne les Américains à s'endetter et à s'endetter gratuitement vis-à-vis -vis de l'étranger, car ce qu'ils lui doivent, ils le lui payent avec des dollars qu'il ne tient qu'à eux d'émettre. Nous estimons nécessaire que les échanges internationaux soient établis comme c'était le cas avant les grands malheurs du monde, sur une base monétaire indiscutable et qui ne porte la marque d'aucun pays en particulier. Quelle base En vérité, on ne voit pas qu'il puisse y avoir réellement de critères, des talons autres que l'or and he uh, starts asking, France asks, asks for their gold and trades in, in the dollars. And at that point, other countries saw this and start jumping on board. And uh, the U.S. lost 50% of its gold from 1959 to 1971, but we still had in 71 about 12 times more dollars that we had created than there was gold. And this run on the bank, basically, the U.S. now being the bank, this is a giant worldwide bank run, because the U.S. for the second time had committed a fraud and created more receipts for gold than there was gold. 
It's, it's that simple. And then finally the markets sort of sensed this. And Nixon was forced to take us off the gold standard because if he had paid out gold until it got to zero, once we couldn't pay on some of those dollars, the entire worldwide monetary system would have collapsed. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. In full cooperation with the International Monetary Fund and those who trade with us, we will press for the necessary reforms to set up an urgently needed new international monetary system. And on August 15th, 1971, all the world's currencies became fiat currency. I don't know why the rest of the world didn't rush out and hang him, <laughs> but, but they didn't. They just all went along with this. To our friends abroad, I give this assurance. The United States has always been and will continue to be a forward-looking and trustworthy trading partner. There have been thousands upon thousands upon thousands of fiat currencies throughout history and there isn't one that survived. It is a 100% failure rate. And we started this experiment when, where all the world's currencies would be fiat currencies simultaneously in 1971. But what we have here, 30 to 40 years, different monetary system, 30 years, 28 years, 39 years plus, what's next? The world is going to have a new monetary system in this decade that we're in. We're going to experience this huge deflationary crash around the world. The world will probably end up on some sort of new monetary system, probably after governments try and print their way out of this and cause hyperinflations of, of all the currencies, and people will just lose confidence in currency. And what do they always go back to throughout history? Time after time, for the last 5,000 years actually, they always go back to gold and silver. In a world of floating currencies, and that's what all national currencies are today, they bob up and down relative to each other, but they're all sinking relative to gold. That includes the dollar as well as the euro and the British pound and all the others. They're going to continue to lose value, continue to lose purchasing power. Personally, I don't think there's any way of avoiding what is coming. There's no way to fix it right now. One of the biggest challenges for human beings is that physiologically we are designed to operate in recency. You know, the fight or flight response is, is literally in my cells, literally. And, and so that when I'm in the wild, it's about I need to look for something to eat or make sure I don't get eaten. And how that translates into the modern world is that we think only about what's happening immediately in front of us. And so we think a long time is last week. In the world of YouTube and Facebook and instant messaging, we think three seconds is a long time. Like, did you get the post already? I already posted it. And the reality is that if you look at history, and I don't mean a week, I don't mean a month, I mean decades, I mean a hundred years, I mean a couple of hundred years, I mean more than a couple of hundred years, you can start to see some patterns. You can see some things that are going on because history repeats itself. There are some trends and there are some movements that you can learn from. And you literally have to go outside of your, your human instincts to look at history because we just want to focus on right now, because as I said, that's about either eating or being eaten. So we're going to go beyond that, and that means not just focusing on the here and now, but learning some real powerful stuff from what's happened, because there just might be some indicators there as what's going to happen in the future. Now, the seven stages of empire, just as a reminder, started with sound money, and then a country uh, adds layers of public works and social programs and then develops a massive military and then puts that military to use and to pay for the war it debases its currency supply which causes a loss of faith in the currency which then leads to a currency crisis and gold does an accounting of the expansion of that fiat currency supply that happened over all those years of the first five stages. We are in the sixth and beginning the seventh stage. Gold started the accounting in the year 2001. It was $250 then, but we're still in the very early stages of this. It's going to fail. Why is the dollar sacrosanct? Why is it not going to happen to the US dollar? What will? 
People think, oh no, it's high technology, or we have computers now, or the internet. And these are ridiculous arguments. The truth is, all fiat currencies have failed, and there's no reason why this one won't. What worries me again so much is that it's a global situation. And so it's going to cause problems on a global basis. This isn't going to be pretty when it happens. I am not an end-of-worlder or a doomsday guy. All you can do is play the hand that you are dealt. If we go to a new monetary system, and I think it's absolutely inevitable, uh, there's just too much energy built up in, in this one that has to release. It has to come crashing down somehow. So these are changes in Chinese holdings. They are accumulating gold. They are getting rid of U.S. Treasury bonds. This is gold held in China. The green line is the cumulative gold that's on this side, this scale. So it's gone from about 700 tons to almost 6,000 tons just since the year 2000. So this is their central bank holdings. This is their mine, mine supply. But this is, and my researcher put all of this data together. You're the first people to see this. This is the amount of uh, gold flowing through the Hong Kong exchange that goes into China. And the past couple of years here, they have ramped up their buying. They know that the dollar standard is coming to an end, and they are protecting themselves. I don't think there's any question we're heading for a new monetary system. The question is, what will it consist of? You know, the four choices are sort of a, res a world of multiple reserve currencies, and Barry Eichengreen. Uh, Berkeley is the leading proponent of this, or leading uh, uh, scholar on this topic. The problem with that, and where I disagree with Eichen Green, is there's no anchor in that system. We did have multiple reserve currencies before in the 1920s, he's right about that, and it was sterling and the dollar, but they were both anchored to gold. And in the post uh, Bretton Woods world, since 1944, it's been one reserve currency, which is the anchor, and it was anchored to gold until 1971. Since then, the dollar has been detached from gold, but all the other currencies are still linked to the dollar. So at the end of the day, we've had an anchor of some kind. We've never had a world of multiple reserve currencies with no anchor. I'm not sure that's that stable. The SDR is the second choice. The SDR is a basket currency sponsored by the IMF. Uh, at least for the time being, it's also printed money. The, the IMF literally prints the SDRs and ships them out to the members. And their reserves go up, exactly the way the Fed creates money and, and bank reserves go up. Uh, but it's not backed by anything. Third choice is gold, some variation on the gold standard. Uh, and the fourth choice is uh, what I call chaos, which is that nobody does anything. There's a lot of wishful thinking. There's a lot of denial. There's a lot of delay. And we get to the point where people just totally lose faith in paper currencies, go to hard assets, and we have a sequential collapse of paper currencies around the world, at which point governments will have to react with emergency measures. And that could include coercion, confiscation, um, you know, various sorts of freezes on paper assets. There could be a lot of things in that scenario. So uh, to me, it's multiple reserve currencies, SDRs, gold, or chaos. Um, I favor gold, but I fear that we may get chaos. I've talked about every 30 to 40 years, the world has a new monetary system. And the thing is that over the years, governments and, these central, and the banks have basically screwed us more and more and more. Uh, and these new currency systems are always created by the same idiots that created the last one that fell apart. It's the big banks, it's the central banks, and it's governments that are creating these new systems each time. And each time, the system they come up with is a system that cheats the population more and enriches the government and the banks more. It's a system that transfers wealth uh, at greater and greater speeds. You know, this one is going to fall apart just like all of the others. Uh, there's a difference this time, though. There's the Internet. People are connected all over the world. Information is spreading, and people are getting educated. You are about to learn one of the biggest secrets in the history of the world. It's a secret that has huge effects for everyone who lives on this planet. Most people can feel deep down that something isn't quite right with the world economy, but few know what it is. Gone are the days where a family can survive on just one paycheck. Every day it seems things are more and more out of control, 
yet only one in a million understand why. You are about to discover the system that is ultimately responsible for most of the inequality in our world today. The powers that be do not want you to know about this, as this system is what has kept them at the top of the financial food chain for the last 100 years. Learning this will change your life because it will change the choices that you make. If enough people learn it, it will change the world because it will change the system. They say that money doesn't grow on trees, but the truth is that the modern banking system creates currency far faster than trees can grow. Most people don't have a clue how currency is created. Economists and bankers make it sound so complex that people think they can't understand it. But I'm going to strip our monetary system down to its essence so that you can see the scam behind the curtain and just how it affects you. Every modern society creates currency in pretty much the same way. But since the U.S. dollar is the majority of the world's currency, I'm going to use the United States as our example. It all starts when some politician says, vote for me and I'll make sure the government provides you more free stuff than my opponent will. But there's no such thing as a free lunch. So to provide that supposedly free stuff, the politicians vote for the country to spend more than its income. This is called deficit spending. To pay for that deficit spending, the Treasury borrows currency by issuing a bond. So what's a bond? If you think about it, a bond is really nothing but a glorified IOU. It's a pretty piece of paper with numbers printed on it that says, loan me a trillion dollars today and I promise over a 10 year period I'm going to pay you back that trillion dollars plus interest. But what you need to understand is that treasury bonds are our national debt. These glorified IOUs are to be paid back by you and I and our descendants through future taxation. Therefore, when the government issues a bond, it steals prosperity out of the future so that it can spend it today. The Treasury then holds a bond auction, and the world's largest banks show up and compete to buy part of our national debt and make a profit on it by earning interest. You'll notice that as we move through this process, the big banks are there, taking a cut every step of the way. This isn't by chance, as you'll see shortly. Then, through a shell game called open market operations, the banks get to sell some of those bonds to the Federal Reserve at a profit. To pay for the bonds, the Federal Reserve opens up its big old checkbook and writes bad, bogus, counterfeit checks that should bounce because they're drawn on an account that always has a zero balance, there isn't one penny in there. To quote from the Boston Federal Reserve, when you or I write a check, there must be sufficient funds in our account to cover that check. But when the Federal Reserve writes a check, there is no bank deposit on which that check is drawn. When the Federal Reserve writes a check, it is creating money. The Fed then hands those checks to the banks and at this point currency springs into existence. The banks then take that currency and buy more bonds at the next treasury auction. But what is a check? A check is also an IOU. When you write a check, you're making a note that says, here is my IOU for cash. All you have to do is go to the bank and pick it up. Now it's very, very important that you understand this process because we're going to come back later and show you the devastating effect this has on you. The Treasury issues IOUs, bonds. The banks then buy those IOUs with currency. The Federal Reserve then writes IOUs, checks, and hands them to the banks in exchange for the Treasury's IOUs, the bonds. And currency is created. So what's really happening is the Federal Reserve and the Treasury are just swapping IOUs using the banks as middlemen, and abracadabra, presto, currency magically springs into existence. This process repeats and repeats over and over again, enriching the banks and indebting the public by raising the national debt. The end result is that there's a buildup of bonds at the Federal Reserve and currency at the Treasury. This process is also where all paper currency comes from. The Federal Reserve and the government mistakenly call it base money because they didn't watch episode one of this series and they don't know the difference between money and currency. But I will correctly refer to it as base currency because it is not money. It is currency and as we've learned, there is a big difference. Money has to be a store of value and maintain its purchasing power over long periods of time. We learned in episode one that earlier in our history, our paper currency was just a claim check. It was a representation for real money of intrinsic value the gold and silver that was held on deposit at the treasury. You could walk into any bank and slap your currency, like say a $20 bill, on the counter and redeem it for real money. 
a $20 gold piece. But now, this base currency that's piling up back here is really nothing but a receipt or a claim check on an IOU, that bond. So it's really nothing but a supply of numbers. The Treasury then deposits the newly created currency into the various branches of the government, and the politicians say, hey, thanks for that. And the government does some deficit spending on public works, social programs, and war. The government employees, contractors, and soldiers then deposit their pay in the banks. Now this may come as a shock to you, but when you deposit your currency with the bank, you're not actually depositing it into an account to be safely held in trust for you. Instead, you're actually loaning the bank your currency, and within certain legal limits, they can do with it pretty much anything they please. This includes gambling in the stock market and loaning it out, at a profit, of course. Now this is where the machine of currency creation really gets cranking, because this is where something called fractional reserve lending comes into play. Fractional reserve lending is exactly what it says. The banks are allowed to reserve only a fraction of your deposit and loan the rest out. Although reserve ratios may vary, I'm going to use a 10% reserve ratio as our example. If you deposit $100 in your account, the bank can legally take $90 of it and loan it out without telling you. The bank must hold $10 of your deposit in reserve just in case you want some of it. These reserves are called vault cash. But why does your bank account still say you have $100 if the bank has stolen $90 of it? Because the bank left IOUs it created, called bank credit, in its place. Now I know this sounds crazy, but here it is in black and white from the Fed. Commercial banks create checkbook money when they grant a loan simply by adding new deposit dollars in accounts on their books in exchange for a borrower's IOU. These are nothing but numbers that the banks type into their computers. And even though these bank credit IOU numbers are very different from base currency numbers, because they only exist in computers, they are still currency. So now there is $190 in existence. Now the reason people take out loans from the banks is to buy something. They're going to buy a house or a car or something like that. So the borrower takes the $90 that the bank loaned to him from your account and he pays the seller of the item. But then the seller deposits that currency into his account and his bank loans out 90% of that and leaves bank credit numbers in its place. So now there's $271 in existence. This process repeats and repeats until under a 10% reserve ratio, an initial deposit of just $100 can create up to $1,000 of bank credit, all backed by $100 of vault cash, just 10%. But as I said, reserve ratios vary wildly. On some deposits, it's 10%. On others, it's 3%. And on some forms of deposits, reserve requirements are zero. The result is that the expansion of the currency supply by the banks is far greater than even this example would lead you to believe. So once again, when currency is deposited in the banks, the banks get to lend it out, and then it gets redeposited and relent, redeposited and relent, redeposited and relent over and over again, creating bank credit all the way. This is where the vast majority of our currency supply comes from. In fact, 92 to 96 percent of all currency in existence is created, not by the government, but here in the banking system. Now, massive amounts of currency spewing into society may at first sound like a fun idea. That is, until you remember one of the most important hidden secrets of money from episode one, that the prices of everyday goods and services act as a sponge on an expanding currency supply. The more currency we have, the more prices rise. This is where inflation comes from. The true definition of inflation is an expansion of the currency supply. Rising prices are merely the symptom. So our entire currency supply is nothing but a couple of bucks whipped up in this hocus pocus scam where the Treasury and the Federal Reserve swap glorified IOUs and a bunch of numbers that the banks just type into their computers. That's it, that's our entire currency supply. It's nothing but a supply of numbers. Some of them printed, most of them typed and there is nothing else. But if you thought that was crazy, get ready to enter the twilight zone of modern economics. We work for some of that currency supply. True wealth is your time, but we trade away moments of our lives, hour by hour, day by day, and year by year, 
for numbers that somebody printed on pieces of paper or just typed into a computer. Now those numbers represent our blood, sweat, tears, labor, ideas, and talent. We are what gives the currency its value. But here comes the really cruel joke. We work hard so that we can save some of that currency, so that we can pay the tax collector in the United States, it's known as the IRS. They then turn it over to the Treasury so that the Treasury can pay the principal plus interest on that bond that the Federal Reserve bought with a check drawn on an account that has nothing in it. Now let's do a recap on this section because this is where the system begins to rob you and I on a massive scale. Much of our taxes are not used for schools, roads, and public services, but to pay interest on bonds that the Federal Reserve bought with a check drawn on an account that has nothing in it. The Federal Reserve is committing fraud. But here's one of the biggest secrets of them all. Before the establishment of the Federal Reserve, there was no need for personal income tax. The Federal Reserve was created in 1913, and that very same year, the Constitution was amended to allow income tax. Do you really think this was just a coincidence? Ask yourself how much income tax you've paid over your lifetime. Much of it has been silently siphoned away into the hands of those who own the system. Yes, this system has owners. Who they are is an even bigger secret that we'll get to shortly. But first, we need to understand the mumbo-jumbo of the so-called debt ceiling. It's all based on a huge paradox. There was interest due on that bond. And there was interest due on every one of those loans that the banks made. That means that there is interest due on every dollar in existence. Let me ask you something. If you borrow the very first dollar into existence, and that's the only dollar that exists on the planet, but you promise to pay it back plus another dollar's worth of interest, where do you get the second dollar to pay the interest? The answer is that you have to borrow that one into existence and promise to pay it back with interest as well. So now there are two dollars in existence, but you owe four, and so on and so on. The result is there's never enough currency to pay the debt. There is always more debt in the system than there is currency in existence to pay the debt. Therefore, the whole system is impossible. It is finite. It will come to an end one day. What would happen if the government stopped borrowing to do deficit spending? Are the payments on those treasury bonds going to stop? What would happen if the public stopped borrowing and going deeper into debt? Are your house and car payments going to stop? No. There is a payment due every month on the principal plus the interest on every dollar in existence and those payments do not stop. If we stop borrowing, then no new currency is created to replace the currency that we used to make those payments. Whether you're making a payment on a loan or paying tax to make a payment on a bond, the portion of the payment that goes to pay off the principal extinguishes that portion of the debt. But the debt also extinguishes the currency. Currency and debt are like matter and antimatter. When they meet, they annihilate each other. If we just pay off the principal only on all the loans and bonds that exist, the entire currency supply just vanishes. So if we don't go deeper into debt every year, look what happens. The whole thing goes into a deflationary collapse under the weight of those payments. Politicians and pundits alike talk about balancing the budget, paying down the debt, and living within our means. They don't understand that that is deflationary. It is impossible to do under our current monetary system without collapsing the whole economy. This is why any talk of a debt ceiling is not only ridiculous, it's delusional. The system is designed to require ever-increasing levels of debt just to continue. And that's why politicians will always kick the can down the road and raise this so-called debt ceiling over and over again until the whole system finally collapses under its own weight. In other words, they don't want it to collapse on their watch. The Founding Fathers of the United States knew the dangers of central banking and fought to free themselves from this very thing. The Revolutionary War started out as a tax revolt, but now we must pay tax just to have a monetary system. Having just suffered through the hyperinflation of the continental dollar, which was printed into oblivion to finance the Revolutionary War, 
They understood the dangers of fiat currency and debt-based monetary systems. So to protect future generations from institutional theft and out-of-control government, they wrote into the Constitution that only gold and silver can be money for the simple fact that you can't print them. Our current system is not only unconstitutional, but it robs us of the liberty and prosperity our forefathers fought and died for. We are all feeling the effects of ignoring the Constitution right now. By forcing more currency into circulation, our purchasing power is diluted. Inflation is a slow and insidious stealth tax that is simply the result of this debt-based monetary system. This system empowers and benefits those who create the currency and receive it first, as they get to spend it into circulation before it has an effect on the economy. They're stealing purchasing power from you and transferring it to the banks and the government every hour of every day because of this false monetary system. And it's not like the people at the top don't know this. To quote the Federal Reserve, the decrease in purchasing power incurred by the holders of money due to inflation imparts gains to the issuers of money. This is a fraud. It is a pyramid scheme. It is a Ponzi scheme. It's a scam and it's a lie. Our entire monetary system is nothing but a form of legalized theft. But here's the biggest con job of them all. The Federal Reserve is not federal. It has stockholders. There is no federal agency that has stockholders. What's a stockholder? A share of stock represents a percentage of ownership in a corporation. So the stockholders are the owners of that corporation. Therefore, the Federal Reserve is a private corporation with owners. And you can see it for yourself if you go to the Federal Reserve's website and it will say, the stockholders receive an annual dividend of 6%. Now we know that the stock in the Federal Reserve was originally issued to the largest banks in the United States. But because of mergers and acquisitions through the years, you can't actually trace who owns the stock in the Federal Reserve. That's a very closely guarded secret. My guess would be that the owners are those primary dealers, the banks that get to make a profit by selling part of our national debt, those bonds, to the Federal Reserve, who buys them with a check from nothing. Then we pay tax to pay the principal and the interest on those bonds so that the Federal Reserve can pay the banks a 6% dividend. Don't be alarmed if you don't quite comprehend the deception of this system at first glance. Very few people do. It is purposely complex. The economist John Maynard Keynes once wrote, by this means, government may secretly and unobserved confiscate the wealth of the people, and not one man in a million will detect the theft. I believe that presented correctly, anyone can understand this system, regardless of how complex it is. So let's do a recap and break it down even more. The way the system works is that, step one, the government creates glorified IOUs. These bonds increase our national debt and put the public on the hook to pay it back. Step two, IOUs are swapped to create currency. The treasury sells the bonds to the banks. The banks then turn around and sell our national debt at a profit to the Federal Reserve, which they probably own. The Federal Reserve then opens its checkbook that doesn't have a penny in it and buys those IOUs with IOUs that it writes, checks on a checking account that has a zero balance. Then they give those checks to the banks and currency just springs into existence. And then the whole process repeats. This results in a buildup of bonds at the Federal Reserve and currency at the Treasury, which is really just a supply of numbers. The Treasury then deposits the numbers in the various branches of the government and we get to step three. The government spends the numbers on promises, public works, social programs, and war. Then the government employees, contractors, and soldiers deposit their pay into the banks. And we get to step four, where the banks multiply the numbers by magically inventing more IOUs through fractional reserve lending, where they steal a portion of everyone's deposit and lend it out. That currency gets redeposited, and then a portion is stolen again. And the process repeats over and over, magnifying the currency supply exponentially. Then we work for some of those numbers, which brings us to step five, where our numbers are taxed. We pay tax to the IRS, who then turns our numbers over to the Treasury, so the Treasury can pay the principal plus the interest on bonds that were purchased by the Federal Reserve 
with a check from nothing. Then we get to step six, the debt ceiling delusion. The system is designed to require ever increasing levels of debt and will eventually collapse under its own weight because politicians always kick the can down the road. They don't want it to collapse on their watch. And finally, step seven, the secret owners take their cut. The world's largest banks own the Federal Reserve. Those banks make a profit selling our national debt to the Fed. They make a profit when the Fed pays them interest on the reserves held at the Fed. And the Fed pays them a 6% dividend on their ownership of the Fed. This system is fundamentally evil. It funnels wealth from the working population to the government and the banking sector. It is the cause of the artificial booms and busts of modern economies and it causes great disparity of wealth between the rich and the working class. And it is only possible because we no longer use real money, we use currency. But worst of all, it is a form of enslavement. Bond is the root word of bondage. Whenever a government issues a bond, it is a promise to make us pay tax in the future. Nobody asked you if you wanted to pay tax today for the prosperity we all enjoyed in the last century. Nobody is asking our children if they want to work hard in the future to pay for the prosperity we're enjoying now. George Washington once wrote to James Madison, no generation has the right to contract debts greater than can be paid off during the course of its own existence. By stealing prosperity from tomorrow so we can spend it today, we enslave ourselves and future generations. Many societies have faced this dilemma in the past and we can learn what the outcomes might be simply by studying what they did and comparing it to what we're doing today. So while I was in Germany, I decided to stop by one of my favorite museums and take you on a kind of crash course of the history of real money, how it evolved, and the twin dangers that arise when money is corrupted. I'm here at the Bundesbank Money Museum in Germany, and this is one of the best museums I have ever seen. And this is where they've got all the great examples of the real gold and silver coins. So come on in and join me. So here we get to the first, uh, this is gold and silver, what they're using to make money. And here we have some very early representations of gold and silver coins. And I love these displays. They start with coins in Lydia. So these coins go back to the very first minting of true coinage. And here we come to our first example of government-issued fiat currency. This is uh, from China. This is from 1375. And what's interesting is I have a chart that compares the value of the paper currency in China compared to silver. And there was a hyperinflation of this currency. It wasn't backed by anything. It wasn't backed by taxes. It wasn't backed by anything in the treasury. They could just print this. And so this went into a hyperinflation because the government was just running its budget by just doing deficit spending by printing. And then I'm going to skip to some of the colonial currency. This is the United States, and each one of these currencies is printed by a different state. We've got Maryland, South Carolina, North Carolina, Connecticut, New York. This one here is particularly interesting. It's printed in the 14th year of the reign of King George III. It's dated March 25th, 1776. So this is just a few months before the Declaration of Independence. It says, uh, "'Tis death to counterfeit." But this was printed just before we started coming out with the continental dollar, which went into a hyperinflation because of pure deficit spending on the Revolutionary War. Uh, and so this is the wall where real money gets corrupted. <laughs> This is where it all turns to paper, which sometimes is backed by something, but it can be a lie. They can print more than they have of the stuff to back it. As we learned in episode two, one of the first things a country does at the outbreak of war is to suspend redemption rights so that their currency is no longer redeemable in gold. This is exactly what Germany did before World War I. After losing the war, they suffered through one of the worst hyperinflations on record when they were burdened with massive reparation payments to France and the Allies. These heavy penalties stifled the German economy and brought it to a standstill, 
leaving the country with the same two choices all indebted nations have faced throughout history, default on their debt or inflate it away. Defaulting was not a viable option as they were completely impoverished, weakened, and surrounded by armed forces ready to take their land. Since their currency was no longer tied to gold, it was decided to light up the printing presses and inflate their way out, paying the debts with new currency created out of thin air. This had drastic consequences. Check out some of this Weimar currency. The display starts with one mark that actually purchased something, but soon the notes rise to the thousands, then the millions, then the billions, and finally the trillions. It's mind-blowing. You'll notice that I'm laughing a little bit as we move through the museum, but I'm not laughing at the people. I'm laughing at the stupidity of central banks and of governments and how we never seem to learn from history. Okay, <clears throat> this is an example of, of uh, different currencies used during the hyperinflation, uh, and they call some of it inflation money and emergency money. This is interesting. They figured the way out of hyperinflation was to print more. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1923, the value of money fell by 50% or more per day. So that means prices are doubling every day if it's falling by 50%. Uh, nearly everyone spent their money as quickly as possible on bread, shares, and other safe assets. Well, I don't consider shares safe assets. Actually, the stock market did not keep up with the inflation. However, this rapid circulation only served to stoke inflation even further. That's the function of velocity of money. It's just it, when velocity picks up, it's just like expanding the quantity. It's got the same effect. At the end, even 144 printing companies working for the Reichsbank could not keep up with the demand for banknotes. Emergency money issued by cities, local authorities, as well as banks and other enterprises started being circulated. So everybody was issuing currency to add to the currency that the government was printing like crazy. Although banknotes with face values of trillions of marks were issued, the vast demand for, for money, that's not correct, the vast demand for currency led to a paper shortage. Printers used anything that could be found, including wool, wood, and silk. So here's some example of wood, wool, and silk currencies over here. <laughs> So this is a great example of how even here, in a museum of what they call money, this is the Bundesbank, one of the world's great central banks, if you can call any central bank great. <laughs> they don't understand the difference between money and currency. They're calling all of this money, and it has nothing to do with money. This is just a promise. It was a promise to pay money at one point, and then it was a broken promise. People will have faith in these government-created currencies, and it allows governments to basically rob their own people. The government erased the debts of, that they had left over in, of, from World War I uh, by just hyperinflating the currency, and basically that transfers all the wealth of the middle class to the government. Uh, the government inflated away the debts, but they also inflated away the prosperity of their entire uh, population. When we were in Germany, we got a chance to shoot in front of the Bundestag, which used to be called the Reichstag. And it felt, it's very, very significant in that uh, out of monetary crisis, you very often see the political landscape change dramatically. Uh, it's the middle class of a country that defines the country with their vote. They're the largest sector of any country, about 70%. And a currency crisis like a hyperinflation wipes out and impoverishes the middle class. And they become filled with fear. And it's very easy for somebody to come in and prey on that fear. And dictators arise out of hyperinflation. And this is one of my greatest fears as far as the United States goes. I think that uh, you know, we all have to be very, very careful and very watchful for what happens in the future. A few years ago, I was interviewing Congressman Ron Paul, and he said, I think that there's going to be a financial collapse before they come around to thinking seriously about monetary policy. But the real thing we have to worry about is not the loss of our wealth. 
It's the rise of a dictator. It's the loss of our freedom. And what's interesting is the rise of Hitler. There were two times where he played on the public sphere. He could never have come to power had there not been a hyperinflation back in 1923. Just one week before the end of that hyperinflation, that's when Hitler made his first big public appearance. Playing to the public fear, Hitler and his stormtroopers took over a beer hall called the Burgerbrau Keller that seats around 3,000 people. And he took the stage by gunpoint and to this literally captive audience, he gave the speech that would change the world. Because of the hyperinflation, the audience had been recently impoverished. Their wealth had been stolen by the government running the printing presses. And so they're all scared. He offers them a scapegoat and tells them he's got the way out. He became very popular after that, and the very next day, uh, the people that were listening to him followed him in an attempt to overthrow the government. He was arrested, tried, and convicted of high treason, and served time. While he was in jail, he was provided with a private secretary, Rudolf Hess, and he actually wrote about half of Mein Kampf while he was serving time. But once the economy started to recover, Hitler lost that leverage, that power. He could no longer play on the fear of the public once the economic situation had changed. By the middle of the Roaring Twenties, he had become a joke. The Nazi party had gone to less than 2% of the vote. Then along came the Great Depression, and Hitler seized this opportunity again. He was the first politician to actually campaign by aircraft, hitting multiple cities in a single day. And the Nazi party went from 2% of the vote to the second largest party in Germany. So playing on the public sphere, Hitler was able to take away the rights of Germans. He was able to, all these guaranteed rights in the Weimar Constitution, private property rights, the right to assemble, public assembly, the right to privacy uh, in the mail, uh, the telephone system. Uh, he just took away all of their rights and seized power. So these are the, some, some of the things that we have to be concerned about and be very mindful of. Economic crisis very often leads to the rise of a dictator. Yeah, the fact that this was just 70 to 80 years ago, basically there are still people alive today that experienced this, but enough of them have died off to where the warnings fall on deaf ears. Berlin is a great example of another massive danger to individual freedom that economic crisis can bring, the swing from capitalism to collectivism. After World War II, the city was basically divided in half, the West being capitalist and the East communist. Germany was reunified in 1990, but even this short period of separation showed the vastly different levels of prosperity that the two systems achieved. So this is the famous Checkpoint Charlie, and, and what's interesting is how quickly an economy can heal. Just 20 years ago, you would have seen a tremendous difference between the East and the West. You'd have one side that has tall buildings and is much more industrialized and new, and then one side that was, that's very old and gray. It was one of the best examples of what a state-run society does to an economy how the more the public relies on government, the worse the general economy gets. What happens, you know, in capitalism you have the greatest disparity uh, between the poorest and the richest individuals. And there's a backlash against that. And you see this happening happen in waves and cycles, this cycle that goes from capitalism to collectivism. Here, the example, I mean, you had this line going right through a city, and one side of the city that was very poor, and the other side, prosperous by comparison. Now, when we go toward collectivism, they want to eliminate this great disparity between the poorest and the richest individuals. But what happens isn't that they raise the standard of living for the poor up here. They drag the whole economy down so that everybody ends up living down here, except for the people that are in running the government. Collectivism is a danger because we've proven time and time again that it doesn't work. The evidence is in. If you look at history, it's clear that maximum prosperity can only be achieved through individual freedom, free markets, and sound money. You'd think that we'd learn from history, but I'm going to show you a few more displays from the museum that prove conclusively we haven't. And this is where we are today. 
This is a sheet of 50 euro notes, and these come out of the printing press, bam, 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 just like those notes did. <laughs> and the entire world today is sort of, uh, every central bank across the planet is creating currency like crazy right now. To, I, th I think we're going into a deflation, so they're trying to stave off deflation right now by printing their way out of it. So here we've got uh, some examples of the technology that governments around the world are putting into their counterfeit currency so that the public can't counterfeit the currency that the governments are now counterfeiting. So you've got all these holograms and watermarks and different threads and different types of paper. And then here's this big old printing plate where they pop these things out a mile a minute. And right now they are hyperinflating the base money around the world, the paper money. Uh, we're going into a deflation, though, of the credit money, the voodoo, hocus-pocus currency that the banks just type into the computer. That's starting to collapse where this stuff is expanding. So we learned in episode four that modern currency creation is a complete scam, but a whole lot of people had trouble believing that it could be true. The European Central Bank has this awesome display that shows you exactly how it's done, and it's basically the same as our episode four. So here's a quick recap, thanks to the ECB. Basically, the central bank and the treasury swap IOUs. The, bank writes, the central bank writes a check and the treasury issues a treasury bond, which is an IOU, and that creates currency. And then it gets, uh, somebody is paid, it gets deposited into a bank account and a thousand marks, they, they would hold 10%. So right here, they're already telling you that his bank account is a lie. He put a deposited a hundred, deposited a thousand in it. They only withhold a hundred in case he wants some of that. And then they loan out 900, which then they, she buys something from this guy. He deposits the 900. They borrow 90% uh, of that and leave just 10% on deposit for him. And the result is, that it expands every thousand ends up creating ten thousand or every one dollar creates ten dollars you know and they've got the result here this it's all sort of a voodoo hocus pocus scheme one of the great things that i've noticed here is that throughout the museum they keep on proving the point that uh, even though this is the bundesbank museum they prove the point that fiat currencies that come off of a printing press eventually go to zero that they're really worthless this says the ideal goal of all monetary systems was to ensure that money is trustworthy and kept in short supply. Metal-based currencies restrict the money supply because metal deposits are naturally limited. However, during the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, the rapidly growing e economy needed a means of payment which could adapt flexibly to this growth. Baloney. You can have a fixed currency supply, and when you have economic growth, it means that the currency gains in purchasing power. In the 20th century, uncovered currencies, meaning unbacked currencies, have been the norm. In principle, the money stock could grow unchecked. This is why central banks must ensure that the money stock is in line with economic growth. Yeah, right. So uh, here we've got my buddy Milton. Actually, Milton was sort of a semi-free market economist. He won the Nobel Prize, so he's considered the dean of the Chicago School of Monetary Thought, which are monetarists. They believe that we should have a Federal Reserve and it should expand and contract the currency supply to achieve stable prices. One of the problems with Keynesians and monetarists and so on is that they think you should expand it and contract it, but they never contract it. <laughs> they just, you know, Keynesian, you're supposed to spend when the economy is bad, the government's supposed to spend and stimulate, and then withdraw currency from circulation to keep us from going into a bubble caused by the expansion of credit and the spending that they did during the bad portion of the economy. So they, they take this rubber band and they stretch it, and it's supposed to come back, but they never do that. They just keep on stretching it to infinity, and here we are, uh, in, right now, where we are in the world is that that rubber band is about to snap with every currency on the planet. And so I'm instability, I'm in deflation, inflation, let me see, I'm going to cause a hyperinflation. 
Oh, it just went off the inflation scale. I guess I did cause a hyperinflation. Oops. <laughs> and now the whole thing is collapsing. <laughs> this game of inflation and deflation has never worked. Right now we're on the precipice of the whole system collapsing and just like the game, our monetary system will reset. This is where the twin dangers we learned about may rear their ugly heads, so it's up to all of us to learn from history. I mentioned earlier that it was the invention of money that allowed humans to prosper and rise out of the Stone Age. But money is only part of the equation. What use is money if you don't have freedom? So what's going to happen? Will we default or inflate our way out of the mess we're in?